Hello, everyone. I'd like to thank you for joining us this morning. My name is Leland Cito. I'm the Director of Business Development for Canada, and I'll be your MC for the morning. Uh, before we get started, I would like to introduce and bring Saeed Amidi onto stage, the CEO and founder of Plug and Play. Hi, everybody. Hello, everybody. How are you? I am not sure for the audience if you can tell, but the sun is shining on us. And uh, it is really, really great to be here almost after uh, 19 months. You know, we are now trying to have more in person and uh, meetings like usually, like we had a few of them in Europe where we had 50, 60 people in uh, person and about five, 600, you know, online. I remember the last meeting I was at was in Stuttgart in July, where we had the uh, Startup Autobahn Expo, and we had about 120 people in the garage. It was a old garage for Mercedes, and I'm telling you, it was hot. It was like, I wish there was less people there, but uh, we had over a thousand people online. And I think this is going to be the future we ha all have to get used to, to be some online, offline events. But I thought I'd give you a quick couple of interesting updates. Uh, sticking to Germany, Last week, we launched what we call H2O Accelerator, or Hydrogen Accelerator, with the city of Hamburg, port of Hamburg, and Shell Oil. So we feel this clean energy, may it be battery technology, hydrogen, it is really the way of future and we would love to play a very big part in it. Some of uh, the projects we are working on, we are launching what we call fleet management and fleet electrification. You know, when I talk to British Telecom, which is like the second largest fleet in UK, they mentioned to us that all of their clients demand from them to have a much uh, cleaner environment. And you know, when you see a telco say my priority is to reduce my carbon footprint and serve my clients better and their clients demand that, it really no more nice to have to say like I'm uh, you know, involved with sustainability, I'm going to reduce my carbon footprint. It is must have. And we are really, really proud. And I do one more announcement uh, because we have a Canadian MC. So we are launching actually three verticals in Alberta, in Calgary and Edmonton. One of them is clean resources, which uh, really Calgary would like to diversify from oil and gas and coal to clean resources. So we actually are going to, uh, you know, accelerate roughly 20 startups per year in Calgary, either from Calgary or we're going to bring them to Calgary. The government is incredibly supportive to fund this startup, work with us to you know, change the ecosystem in Calgary. Also, we are launching a digital health accelerator there, as well as smart city. And then this is supposed to be a beginning of our fall summit with supply chain. I leave the supply chain updates to my colleagues, but I have to share one little other news with you. 
today uh, one of our startups that we invested in in Berlin, Germany about seven years ago. You know, we used to run these accelerators that we give 25,000 euro to two young people and for 5% equity, I feel like it's a highway robbery now. So we gave this Valentino and Maximilian 25,000 euro and they started a bank called N26. Today was announced that N26 raised $900 million at nine billion valuation, and they became the second largest bank in Germany. And again, why I'm mentioning this, first, I think it's a happy occasion. <laughs> We still have a percent or two of the company, but it is really, that's what technology and innovation is all about. It took Deutsche Bank over 100 years to be the first bank in Germany. And this uh, N26 now, I believe it's less than seven years, and now is the second largest bank in Germany. And that could only be possible with technology, innovation, and what the consumers demand right now. They demand the uh, you know, immediate service. Like last thing I would say is I've been working with Deutsche Bank for 20 years in New York. And when we wanted to open an office in Berlin, uh, seven years ago with Deutsche Bank, they took them two weeks to open a bank account for me. They said they have to check with New York, I have to show who I am, and I accept that, you know, they want to be careful, but it takes three minutes with N26. Compare two weeks, three minutes, and you imagine who is going to win. So we really need to embrace technology in every industry, including supply chain, logistic, fleet management. And I hope you guys have a great, great summit. So I turn it back in to our Canadian MC. Thanks. Thank you, Saeed. That was amazing. All right, before we get started today, I'm just gonna go through the agenda really quickly. Um, so starting us off, we'll have our opening remarks with Mike Zeons. Following that, we'll have four fireside chats, following which we will do our award ceremony, and then a new partner announcement, and then closing remarks brought to you by Farzine. So with that being said, it would be my pleasure to bring on stage the founder of the supply chain vertical, Michael Zeons. Thank you, Leyland. Uh, welcome, everyone. It's great to be back, like Saeed said, in Silicon Valley. Uh, we have been waiting to come back in person for a long time, and now the hybrid events are, are starting, and hopefully we'll be back to more in person soon. But uh, just to talk a little bit about the supply chain program, you're all great friends of the, the supply chain program at Plug and Play, which I started thanks to Saeed's support in 2017 and built it with Farzine now. It's, it's grown a lot, as you know. And, it's been an amazing COVID actually for supply chain, although it's been obviously a horrible situation around the world. We've actually seen a, an amazing amount of oversubscribed rounds with startups in our portfolio. Uh, amazing uh, growth with startups. Corporate partners are utilizing more startups as there's an increased need for visibility and automation in the supply chain. So it's, uh, it's been kind of a, a great year for us uh, on the investment side. and in terms of expanding new offices. You can see here, these are just the offices that we currently have in the supply chain program. So obviously this is our headquarters, uh, but we have our office in Arkansas. Grant is here as well. We have Keon, who's gonna be launching the office in Savannah, which we're super excited about. So now we'll have an office kind of in the middle of America. We'll have an office on the East Coast with Savannah. We have our Silicon Valley office on the West Coast, and now we have Toronto as well. 
uh, with, with Leyland. So we're super excited about that. And also we have a few offices in Europe uh, with Hamburg working on maritime logistics. And then in Hamburg with the program Said mentioned around hydrogen and, and other areas. So super excited about the growth and, and working with startups from all around the world. And you'll see a lot of them here pitching. Uh, we're very proud to have Dot Foods just join us. Uh, Jeff just joined us uh, as one of our newest partners. So super excited, very large kind of food distribution company. And uh, also we, we have the folks from Savannah here. So you'll get to kind of meet and interact with them a bit. So we're very proud to work kind of and expand the supply chain program. Even despite COVID and everything, our program has grown and become, and more, become more strong. Uh, we're very grateful uh, to all the mentors that are listening. So uh, yeah, we have a lot of people around the world that have real experience, that have sold startups, that have been like Chris Saltemeyer, who's the EVP of logistics at Walmart, who's now part of our board, uh, who's able to mentor some of the startup companies and people with amazing experience that can give back to the startup. So we're very grateful for their time uh, as it's very challenging to build a startup. So we need as many people supporting them as possible. And uh, these are some of the great people that kind of support us regularly as mentors. Uh, these are just some of the, the numbers. We have a couple batches you'll get to see from today. So the Toronto program, also the Silicon Valley program, where we've made 60 connections in Silicon Valley, 21 in Toronto. Uh, we've had 92 mentorship sessions. So the mentors are very, very active. And then 14 workshops uh, throughout these programs. Uh, you can just see here just a little bit of information on some of the startups. Uh, so most of the startups are seed stage where they really benefit from the mentorship and the people that can really help kind of build their company and find product market fit working with the large corporates. And then we have some more later stage startups like at the Series A level um, and some startups that just fund it themselves and are bootstrapped. So, uh, so yeah, we've made three investments actually in this current batch that we're very excited about. One of them is Avatur, which is able to help with uh, essentially visualizing like warehouses, we're going to do a demo, also a Prologis's warehouse and Rider and some others. Uh, we have Quick, Quick Returns, which is doing returns, and then Repower, which is a marketplace for tractors and trailers. So we're really excited. We want to invest more. Uh, Plug and Play is now capable of making larger investments. Which are, traditionally, we would invest 100K into a lot of these startups, but now we are capable of making larger investments up to a million dollars as well in Series A, B, and C. Uh, we just invested in a company called Einride, which is doing amazing, which is an electric autonomous truck that we think could be huge in, in the transportation market. Uh, they'll, they'll come up with some big announcements soon. And then these are just the startups we want to honor today. That This is kind of like their graduation, even though a lot of them are just online just because of COVID. But uh, if anyone wants to connect to any of these amazing startups, we'd love to connect you guys. Uh, we're very proud of kind of what they're doing and the traction they're getting. Um, we, we believe that they've been selected for this program. They're, they are a market leading company. So hope to be able to connect everyone to, the, to, to these great startups. So I hope everyone enjoys the summit. Welcome. Uh, it's amazing to be back here and, and start events here in, in Silicon Valley. So with that, I pass it back to you, Leland. Hey, thank you, Mike. All right, so getting into the content of today, it'd be my pleasure to introduce Aaliyah, who will be go introducing a fireside chat between C.H. Robinson and Doddle. Hello everyone, my name is Alia Meliborska and I'm a Partner Success Director on the Supply Chain Team. I would like to welcome Eric Maxfield, who is a Director of Innovation at CH Robinson, and Scott Pearson, Regional Sales Director at Data Robot. Hello guys. Hey, good morning. Hi, Alia. Nice Hello. to see you. Yes, nice to see you too. Thanks for joining us today. I've provided a quick introduction for, for both of you, but please tell us about your companies and what you do. I can start off. Uh, Eric Maxfield, Director of Innovation for CH Robinson. We're a global third-party uh, logistics company. Um, you know, we we facilitate the, the movement of goods all around the world. Yeah, and I'm Scott Pearson. I'm a regional sales director for Data Robot. And Data Robot is a, I guess you could call us a late-stage startup at this point. We've been around since 2012, and we are a software company with an AI platform, um, and so. That means a lot of things to a lot of people, but it's essentially predictive modeling um, that's been automated for the purposes of you know making life easier for for analysts and data scientists. Great, thank you. And uh, now let's talk about the pilot you did together. And Eric, uh, 
maybe you can tell us a little bit about what type of problem area were you looking to solve? Yeah, sure. So, you know, at, at Robinson, we have a, a pretty significant and growing data science uh, group, but we also have a, a large analyst community. And quite frankly, those, those analysts have a lot of domain expertise. So just knowing there's been a lot going on in, in, in this tech space, uh, we wanted to see what tools and technologies were available for that community and, and kind of the realm of that uh, citizen data scientist. And so we, we started exploring, we started with that use case uh, you know, we explored a lot of different technologies, uh, wanting to see just what's out there. We met a, a number of startups and other companies that were focused on, on a number of different areas, and, and we're great to meet them because I think there's some future collaboration points. But we ultimately ended up uh, furthering and going into POC with kind of this auto ML platform idea to see if we could provide an uplift to that analyst community. Uh, great, thank you. And uh, what was uh, the process like during the POC? How did you know there was a fit between you? And uh, maybe Scott, you can start. Yeah, so the POC process that we have is is, is fairly structured and, and we followed that with, with CH Robinson and they were a great partner. You know, the way we sort of start this out is we, you know, mutually identify, you know, a use case or use cases that we want to try to solve during the proof of value. And so, you know, we have a kickoff call where we look at the data, we talk about the problem, and we make sure that there's, you know, a good fit there. The next step is, is really the participants of the POV were required to take some sort of basic, you know, self-paced training just to get acquainted to the platform so that when we kicked off the POV, they kind of, you know, knew a little bit about what they were doing. And then that was followed by a formal kickoff where we did a little more, you know, intensive training for the participants um, and had one of our customer facing data scientists you know, walk the team through the problem they were trying to solve and sort of, you know, teach as they went, so to speak. Um, and then really, you know, over the next three or four weeks, there was a series of sessions, ongoing sessions where the team would get back together um, and the participants would ask questions of the customer facing data scientist and they would, you know, just sort of iterate and solve together. And then ultimately we wrapped it up at the end and sort of, you know, did a debrief to um, ensure that we accomplished the mission we, we set out to solve. So that's kind of the, the process from a very high level. Eric, anything to add? Yeah, no, I think Scott hit on it. On a great, you know, from us, we, we did, did POCs with a few different platforms. And so that process was somewhat similar, but I think one of the things that data robot really differentiated themselves through our exploration is some of what Scott touched on. And that was really the people behind Data Robot and knowing and the ability, you know, this is new technology that we'd be bringing into our ecosystem and feeling comfortable that we had the resources on their side to help get our analysts up to speed, train, starting to extract value was, was one of those differentiators. So we followed that POC path with a number of different providers, but say why we came back and we did a secondary POV with, with that robot was because of that people part of it as well. Great, thank you for sharing. And then uh, what were some of the challenges you encountered? How did you guys solve them? Yeah, you know, I would say the challenges and, and I would imagine Scott would agree, right? We're, we're on more on the Robinson side and that's, and that's really related to probably the, the availability of the resources to dig in and get trained and, and, and use the platform. Um, obviously this year, especially, and then last year, you know, supply chain logistics has been a challenging marketplace and, and our analysts are, are there helping our, you know, our capacity teams, our commercial teams and, and our customers and suppliers every day. And so getting them, you know, finding time for them is difficult. You add in the fact that, you know, COVID has put everyone in a remote environment, right? And so just aligning those calendars and getting and just plugging that along, quite frankly, that was probably the, the biggest challenge I think we we uh we we met during this process scott would you agree or yeah yeah i would i would just say i i didn't think there were any major challenges i think ch robinson was a, a great partner and i think you know a lot of that was attributed to the fact that you know we we just kept a dialogue and we kept transparency throughout the process and you know if if there were slowdowns on the chr side eric would let us know you know and, and it was just an open dialogue so it was a very collaborative process and i think overall definitely you know one of the most successful if not the most successful POV I've been involved in just because of that you know working relationship yes totally understand transparent communication is very important 
And then, Eric, I know that you were going through the POC process with, the, with two other companies. How did you come uh, to the conclusion that that robot was the best partner for C.H. Robinson? Yeah, when, I think when we took a step back and just looked at, you know, the platform itself uh, was, was very robust, a lot of features. And, and when we talk about their roadmap and some of the acquisitions they've made to continue to bolster that and add value to that platform uh, made us feel really good. And the staying power, we felt comfortable with them as well. But I'd still go back to that point of differentiation was, um, A, through the sales cycle, Scott just, you know, being keeping in touch, but also, you know, being understanding that we, you know, we're going to have to work on our timeline. And he was very understanding and working with us. And then to that point of, all right, once we, we were, you know, once we're ready to go and, and we want to get our people up and running, feeling very comfortable that that team would be able to do that. They highlighted that through the sales process. Uh, they spent a lot of time and energy digging into that aspect of it. And so for, you know, those reasons are really why we came back to data robot over the others. And um, if you guys can share any best practices and also things to avoid when embarking on a POC, that would be great and very helpful for a lot of startups, I believe. Yeah, I guess, you know, from my perspective, I think, you know, just best practices wise, it's, it's really important to sort of define metrics up front and, and really determine mutually what you're trying to accomplish. You know, I think the last thing that, that either party wants to have is sort of a you know, uh, a POV where, you know, the, maybe the, 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 the company's testing the software is not really engaged. Right. And it's just kind of a, a fun effort to play with the software and just check it out. I think, you know, because so much time is invested on both sides, it's, it's just really important to establish those metrics and to be committed to the project. And we really saw that from, from CH Robinson, which, which was awesome. You know, as I was saying earlier, just, you know, keeping the dialogue going, having that transparency is, is super important as well. And so I would say those are kind of, you know, two really important, um, you know, best practices from my perspective. Eric, do you, do you have anything to add? Uh, you know, I, yeah, I would agree with, with that sentiment. I think, yeah, up front, even before embarking on, you know, internally on our side, you know, Robinson, like a lot of other companies in the in plug and play environment are very large, right? And I think just making those connection points and making sure people are aware what we're we're about to go, you know, what, what POC we're going down. And, and so if they want to participate or want to have, uh, you know, a seat at the table, they have that. So as we get through that, and to Scott's point, we put out those measurement success. We're not, we're not faced with any challenges down the road. We're, we're getting that uh, done up front. And then the other, the only other thing, and Leah, you hit on earlier, right? And that's just open and honest communication. You know, things aren't going to move as smoothly as you may want. And, and I think if there is challenges, if you're just open and front and constantly mm -hmm. communicating, being honest with what's going on, uh, you can meet those challenges, you know, much easily, much more easily down the road. So, you know, that would that would be my additions to that point. That's great. And um, what were your key takeaways and learnings? And uh, if you can give one piece of advice to startups preparing for a POC, what would that be? Um, you know, I think the key takeaways, the, the, the advice I'd give to startups, um, engaging with larger organizations uh, like a C.H. Robinson is one, you know, Scott has, if I'm the right person to deal with this project, right? But if you're dealing with other companies, just making sure that you're, you're dealing with the right person for that particular project, because you could possibly, in, you know, connect with the wrong individual. So just doing your due diligence up front that you got the right audience members. And just understanding how big organizations are, there are some checks and balances you have to have. There are, you know, it, it can take a little bit longer. Um, and so just being aware of that and, and, and communicating, I think those are the, the big takeaways I would and advice I'd give to a startup. Yeah, and from the vendor partner perspective, and you know, I totally agree with Eric, but I think, you know, from, from our side of the fence, it's really, you know, prioritizing your time and efforts, right? So, um, there, there's a lot of white space in this, in this market. And I think there's a lot of companies that are just kind of poking around and, you know, just kind of exploring. And, and so I think it's really important to not just go into something, hoping that there's an opportunity there or, you know, uh, uh, a problem to solve. I think so, you know, the taking the time up front to just make sure that, you know, there is, there is a problem there and, and that you can solve it. Right. And so you can spend your time accordingly, because again, it's, it's a big effort on both sides 
um, to engage in these POVs. So it's it's important to spend that time up front. And then, you know, we've talked about this a number of times too, and it's it's just common practice, right? Just, you know, be upfront and honest with, with each other along the way and, and uh, you know, solve problems as they come along and just, uh, you know, keep that transparency. Those are great advices. Thank you very much. So what's the vision for the future? You know, the, the way we've thought about utilizing data robot, I'd go back to what we use, the use cases we, we use for the POV. So one of them we looked at was, you know, within a subset of our clients who are more transactional, identifying where there might be uh, red flags for churn, right? Where that might not be as apparent with some of our more larger enterprise type accounts. Um, you know, in the future, we're going to look at a number of different areas and, and look at it as a, uh, an augmentation to our data science practice. So if we look at data science, we're probably going to be focused on some of the biggest challenges uh, within the enterprise. And what we want to do with our analyst community is allow them to explore and unlock value in maybe some of these subsections across, across our enterprise uh, using data robots technology and platform. Yeah, and I, I would say that, that that vision is is really similar to what we're seeing actually playing out amongst our customer base. It's really interesting because ever since we started, we've been talking about democratization, right? And extending data science capabilities to audiences or in groups outside of, of you know the core data scientists. And now we're really starting to see that happen. Um, you know, I would just involved with a customer who did a renewal this year, and you know, they they did a very major expansion because they found that. You know, the analyst community or the, the people who know the data and know the business are able to use the platform to start to solve problems. So you see this, this huge acceleration of, you know, the number of use cases that you're able to tackle. And then, you know, as a result, you know, much greater ROI um, from the project. So, so yeah, it's, 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 it's real and it's happening. And so we're, we're really excited about that since that was kind of our vision for this um, from the start. Yes, the, the future sounds very exciting. Well, thank you both, Eric and Scott, for your time and for the conversation. It's been a pleasure learning more about your successful collaboration. Uh, thank you and take care. Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Elias, Scott, and Eric. Up next, it'll be my pleasure to introduce Amy, who will be facilitating the fireside chat between Yamato and Doodle. Hello, everyone. My name is Amy Ta. I'm the Director of Partner Success in the Supply Chain Program at Plug and Play. I'll be the moderator for the session where we'll learn about Yamato, Japan's largest parcel carrier, and Dotto, a British software company, teamed up to launch its proprietary pickup and drop-off network to improve the e-commerce delivery experience. I'd like to now welcome them on this virtual stage with me. We have uh, Kay Matsumoto, um, Manager of the Digital Innovation at Yamato, and Adam Lofer, Deputy CEO at Dotto. Welcome, guys. Really great to have you guys here today to share a little bit about the partnership. Um, I thought maybe we'll start uh, off with some brief introductions. Um, Kay, maybe you can start us off here. Sure, of course. Um, thank you for hosting us today. Um, I'm Kay from Yamato. Um, Yamato is a logistics company in Japan. Um, such as like UPS uh, or FedEx here. And uh, Yamato is a, uh, Yamato has a almost almost 40% of the market share as a last mile, carry, uh, last mile solution provider. And then uh, also uh, our company size is like, um, we have a two, almost 200,000 uh, employees. And then last year we shipped uh, almost two, two billion parcels uh, in 2020. Um, yeah, thank you. Awesome, thank you. And Adam, please tell us a little bit about Dotto and yourself. Sure, um, so again, thank you for having us. Um, so Dotto, as you said, is a British software business. We are seven and a half years into our journey. And really, we, we, our platform delivers solutions in the space of e-commerce fulfillment. And our biggest two focus areas up till now have been um, driving adoption of out-of-home delivery. This is the idea that, um, you know, trying to get people used to receiving parcels at convenient third-party locations. 
which delivers a huge number of benefits for the parcel carrier, the consumer, and indeed the environment. And also in the area of returns, which has been a fast growing phenomenon in e-commerce over the last few years, particularly in the apparel um, sector. Um, and we've been fortunate enough to work with Yamato in Japan. Um, we have a, a large customer in Australia. Um, we, we have business in the UK, which is our home market in continental Europe. And uh, we've also been working for the last couple of years in the US. Amazing, amazing. Very familiar with the, the carrier logistics world then. Um, yeah. Well, it's worthy to mention that uh, Dotto is also, a, is also a, an alumni of our supply chain accelerator program and Yamato has been part of the plug and play family for over three years now and with a satellite office in our plug and play headquarters that easily meet startups. Um, with that, um, Kay maybe can talk a little bit about how this engagement started, how this partnership started. You know, was there um, a problem that you had identified or was this an opportunity that just came up when you uh, learned of Dottle? Yeah, sure, of course. Um, yeah, so the, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Dodo was participating uh, in the uh, accelerator program at Plug and Play. And then that's how, um, how I met uh, with uh, Dodo teams. And then what we're trying to solve was um, digitizing and returning and a pickup experience uh, in Japan. So uh, the reason why the, my job is my job is business development and also to think of new business idea. And through my research, I realized that in, in Europe and the US, receiving and returning experience is um, digitized and then it, it is very simple. So, um, and in Japan, those process were not digitized. People still need to um, write label um, and then such the uh, address to return. So, um, and then I realized that in the, in the future, returning rate, rate is going to be increased in Japan as well, um, that because of uh, e-commerce volume is increasing. So, uh, I mean, increasing every year. So we wanted to um, digitize the, uh, pick up and then uh, return experience in Japan before return rate is going to increase uh, same as uh, uh, e-commerce volume. So that's the, that's the background. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Adam, did you have anything to add to that? There's probably a few dynamics in the Japanese market that um, are really specific to Japan that make it such an attractive market for, for our, our joint proposition. I think firstly, um, the, the logistics services provided by businesses like Yamato in Japan really are like white glove services. And you hear of instances where if you're not at home to receive your parcel, your local courier will attempt to deliver that parcel an unlimited number of times. Um, which if you think about, you know, if you drew a line for the growth in e-commerce and how many parcels that translates to over the next 10 years, and you just think about how many failed deliveries you're gonna have and the strain that that's gonna start to put on traditional logistics infrastructure, you can quickly see that that's, a, that's an unsustainable model. So that particular dynamic in Japan makes it ripe for innovation. I think also in Japan, there are well-reported um, you know, issues with a growing uh, an aging population. And that really has manifested itself as well in the in um, sort of logistics, where you have, I think the last time I heard, you had three available jobs as logistics drivers per candidate. So a huge undersupply of drivers. So again, how can you deliver all of these parcels in a really sort of efficient way? That doesn't mean more and more vehicles and more and more drivers. And also you have the classic dynamics like you do in the UK, where you have very densely populated small land, small land mass, which creates all of the sort of congestion and efficiency challenges that, you know, we would all experience as drivers in and around big cities. So there are just lots of interesting things once we got stuck into the market with Kay and the Yamato team that made, you know, our proposition really stand out as something that could, could be really exceptional. Yeah, amazing. Um, and I, I'm going to dive into the next topic here, and this is really about the make or buy decision. 
um, you know, how, how does one decide to work with a third party versus building something themselves? Um, and Kay, maybe you can touch upon this um, decision that you guys had to make within Yamato. Um, you know, how did you choose to, to work with that? How do you know that was the right partner for you guys? Sure, sure. Um, good question. Um, of course, there, there are um, always pros and cons, but in this case, our e-commerce solution team and also I, we, uh, I thought having a partnership with Dodo is the best way because of the, uh, because they have a knowledge about the, about returning and, you know, put uh solution market. And then also we can rely on, on their experience. So, um, because digital return, return operation was first time approach for us. And then Dodo was already launched uh solution in a, in a several country for example and also um for example dodo is not just only providing software for operation dodo also provides add value solutions to shippers um such as return analytics dashboard which we are going to uh launch uh in japan uh i mean we already launched in japan and then dodo knows that just just digitize, digitizing the operation is not enough to to provide the analytics solution to to shipper is very important too um yeah so that's the that's the one thing and also um um yeah dodo has a um necessary solution uh as a as a package so that's that's why we choose choose to collaborate with dodo and also yeah. the, the strategy is also like aligned as well. Yeah, yeah. I think it's good to, to work with somebody who is very experienced and, and good for that speed to market piece. And Adam, you know, how about yourself? Um, you know, I'm pretty sure there's some challenges working with, um, you know, a large corporation. Uh, there's differences in culture and, you know, geographic location. Um, and we can touch upon some there. Yeah, sure. So, um, I mean, the, the build versus buy conundrum is one we always face because we typically sell into large enterprise businesses who have, you know, huge IT teams and will traditionally have built their own technology platforms. So, you know, it, it, it's a challenge that we're used to facing. I think in the case of Yamato, um, you know, I guess we were lucky that we stumbled across, you know, a very traditional um, Japanese business, but one, um, you know, which, which is now really investing in innovation. I guess the fact that they, you know, have great people like Kay and are prepared to send Kay to, you know, the West Coast of the US and engage in programs like the plug and play accelerator programs is a really good demonstration of their, you know, open mindedness and appetite to, you know, innovate around, you know, what, what's be, what's a hundred year old business. Um, I think Dodo is the first international software provider that Yamato has used to drive some of its core operating platforms. Um, and I don't think it's really had a change of service for the last 30 or 40 years. So, you know, if you'd have said to us a couple of years ago, um, you know, how do you fancy your chances of partnering with Yamato? I think you would have thought that was really difficult. Um, what, what is, you know, what we could never have anticipated was, as Kay said, the unbelievable strategic alignment we, we had and really that allowed us to move very quickly through the gears um, and get to a position where we were working together. I think that there have definitely been a number of challenges and Kay and I, you know, from our respective sides have been working really hard with our teams to try and navigate some of these challenges, but I probably can't underestimate the cultural differences between a traditional Japanese business and a Western scale up business. Um, I think there's the obvious stuff like language, time zone, um, but I think also there's sort of corporate behavioral differences that are very difficult to understand and be sensitive to when you're starting out. And I think even in the world of technology, you know, the way we run our technology teams and, and you know, deliver and test work is very different to how the Yamato team do that. So for an example, uh, if I think through some of the user acceptance testing phases that we've been through, some of the initial ones were very challenging because there was such a difference in expectation around, you know, what whose responsibility testing was, how you processed results, how you reported on results. 
really simple things that we thought we'd all tackled, you know, as part of the planning. But then you get into it and it just highlights, you know, oh my God, in some scenarios, we're really a long way apart. So I think there's been a constant, um, you know, looking into the program from, you know, people in commercial roles like us to, to, to just make sure that the operating and delivery teams are working together, we're picking up any differences uh, and sort of addressing any issues that arise as they arise. Yeah, yeah. And did you feel the same um, about the challenges, Kay, or were there um, others that you want to highlight there? Yeah, um, yeah, I totally agree with Adam. And then, so culture is a very different uh, between, you know, um, traditional company like Yamato and then, um, you know, young, um, you know, cutting edge technology uh, type of company like um, Dodo. Um, so there, there was a lot of challenge too. Um, but also like Adam um, and his team always uh, try to address where is it, if, if we are on the same page or not. And then so do I too. Um, so that was a, uh, that's that's why we could have a collaboration. Uh, you know, e even uh, in a in a very uh, short time, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Nice. it's like a lot of communication, a lot of alignment is very important here. Um, you know, with that, after working together for you know a year and a half, you know, maybe you guys can share some of the results um, that came out of this partnership. Okay, maybe yeah. I'll have. You. Adam, maybe you can get started there. Yeah, so yes, yeah, sure. Um, so we, as you say, we've been working together a year and a half. Um, the first six months we were integrating and, and customizing our platform so that it was ready to roll out under the Yamato brand in Japan. Uh, I mean, since then we've sort of, as Kay explained, a big part of this with digitizing um, sort of third party pick up and drop off parcel locations that have been running, you know, traditional and analog process processes. So as of today, I think um, we've just about to tip past the 5000 location mark, we set ourselves an ambitious goal of getting to 10,000 within the first year of operation. Um, so it's sort of on our way towards that target at the moment, we've integrated a number of um, well known merchants in Japan onto the platform. So, you know, one of the largest online apparel businesses in Japan is called Zozo Town. And they were the first retailer who've onboarded and now offering our network of locations for collection. Um, hot on the heels of that, we very quickly started working on the digital returns platform. That went live, um, I think about six weeks ago at the end of the summer. And, you know, again, really high profile first brand has onboarded on the returns platform, which is Gap. And we've also added on a couple of the local brands. And, you know, there's now a really exciting pipeline of brands who are looking to, to sort of join the network and the solution as part of that. So it's been a very sort of fast paced, hardworking start to the relationship. You know, it, it's a long term relationship. So this is all about putting in place the building blocks that are going to help us change customer behavior and really transform and, and drive innovation in this logistics space. Amazing. Congrats on, on the launch uh, recently. Um, and Kate, how, how does all of this impact um, Yamato and, and the customers? Yeah, sure. Um, in Yamato, um, that was actually a um, huge impact for us because like this is the first time to um, collaborate with uh, global startups. Um, and then, uh, so again, like there's a, a lot of challenge, but we also um, kind of overcame um you know the challenge uh through uh, through this activity um so that's that's a that was a very uh, huge impact to internal yamato um because we realized that um if uh if we collaborate with uh global cutting edge technologies uh startups who has a cutting edge technologies um we can quickly launch the uh, new service in the uh in the market um so that was a that was great benefit and then uh for uh, client wise um as men, as as adam mentioned um we 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 expanded our poodle network uh 5000 uh 5000 more uh in japan and then which is we are not we are not approached to um install our uh Pudo location uh in japan for example um um third party 
retail store or pharmacy uh, pharmacy um we people can not um you know receive item uh from yamato for example but you know in the us obviously like you know um for example if you buy something from amazon you can you can receive at um 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 not anywhere but you know some some retail store right so um those type of exp experience uh we uh we could provide uh through uh through the dodo, dodo collaboration amazing amazing and i know you guys didn't do a proof of concept or a pilot okay um you know how did you know that you know this was going to be this was going to work sure um the reason why is uh, uh the the reason why we had a partnership with our pilot poc is so um as as adam mentioned align align the strategy and also our, uh yamada's couch as well so we felt that um dodo always care about customer experience and that's yamato always uh thinks uh most important things as well um and also um as a strategy wise um yamato wanted to um expand the Pudo network uh in the nation wise uh wise because the um uh, one of the reasons is that people's life uh life is changing um lifestyle is changing so we thought that um um we need to develop more option to to receive and then return items so that's that was a uh, uh our strategy and then so um to increase the pool locations um yeah again one of the one of the strategy and then also um dodo dodo solution is able to expand our um you know to the network at third party location like i mentioned um the third party retail store or pharmacy um that's that's the yeah that's that's really important for us because um um for example if in japan people come here every um in the, in the downtown tokyo uh from a from more um uh countryside and then so uh especially young people so young people doesn't have a time to receive an item uh at their store i mean their their, their house so there's there's a uh another another option was necessary so yeah the strategy was very aligned yeah good good i'm glad i'm glad this happened between you guys sounds very successful um we're almost out of time here but um may i'll save the the best for last here uh, you guys maybe can share some key takeaways and learnings from working together. Um, you know, what advice can you give to other startups working with large corporations um, and vice versa? And, and maybe Adam, you, guys, you can kick us off here. So I think what well, one bit of advice I can think of immediately is, um, you know, any, anything can happen. Yeah, I think I mentioned that I would never have thought a couple of years ago that, you know, we would so so quickly and successfully launch a partnership with a business like Yamato in Japan. Um, and it just goes to show, you know, if you, if, if you put yourself out there and you back yourselves as a team, then anything is possible. Um, and I think the other thing, which, which is probably a given, and I'm sure everyone knows, but building trust is unbelievably important. I think even we had, you know, we had to deliberately work at that even more so because of sort of the language and cultural barriers that we had that probably mean you start, you know, from, from a bit further apart than you normally would. Um, and we did that in a number of ways, but, but both of our teams invested a lot of time traveling back and forth between London and Tokyo to begin with. We also um, hosted the Yamato team in Australia so that they could see what we'd done in Australia and, and see some of our solutions firsthand. And for a scale up looking to partner with a business like Yamato, it's such an enormous opportunity for us. You don't want this just to be a one and done thing. You want this to be a long term partnership and you want to be able to grow your business on the back of these types of relationships. And the only way you're going to do that is to have that relationship you know, based on a very strong foundation of trust. So we, we worked really hard at that um, at the outset, and that really did set us up very, very well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Trust. Building that trust is very important there. Okay, um, you have anything to add? Any advice you can give to startups? Sure, sure. Of course. Um uh yeah, of course, uh building a uh you know trust is the most important things. And also um if I um 
if I have an added comment it, on that, um, that depends on the culture and then also, I mean, um, yeah, culture in the company. The business process uh, is, a, is a very different. Uh, approval process is a very different. So um, uh, to, to understand those, you know, process uh, each other is uh, one of the most important case and then because we can align the, um, the uh, project process as well and the, the timeline too. And also um, Adam and my, uh, my team and also um, um, uh, his, uh, his uh, Dodo's key, per, uh, pers key person, we always had a show, uh, smaller, smaller meeting uh, after the um, more like entire group meeting. And then we always address that um, if we are on the same page. And then um, if there is any issue or concern, like we always sharing. That's uh, uh, that that was very uh, important, and um, I think that's one of the reasons why uh, we could launch the uh, project together uh, in a, in a short time. And yeah, yeah, I think I think that's the most important things. Amazing! I'm hearing trust, communication, and transparency are all very important here in play. Oh, very and then oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Yeah, I I wanted to uh, mention about you know. Um, Dodo always show us uh, uh, their operation. Like for example, um, the, uh, as as Dodo uh, as Adam mentioned, uh, he took me a uh, uh, Australian Post uh, uh, project with the Australian Post, and then uh, we we did the same things. Um, we uh, when when Adam and his team came to Tokyo, um, we we took them to uh, our operation and then show the uh, show the actual operation how how the operation works. The reason why is that, you know, lang obviously there's a language barrier. So um, to, to solve those issue, um, show, show actual operation is, uh, uh, yeah, it was, you, you, you worked very well to understand each other. Yeah, nice, nice. So always have a demo ready and, and really, you know, try really hard to communicate and get that message through and your value proposition. Awesome. Well, it was really great chatting with the both of you guys and to, you know, let everyone know a little bit about your partnership, um, wishing you guys much success and continued um, partnership together. So thank you again so much for your time here today. Thank you very much. Thank you. you can take care. Thank you, Amy, Adam and Kay. Up next, it would be my pleasure to introduce Claudius, who will be calling in from our Hamburg, Germany team. He will be introducing the fireside chat between Willanius Wilhelmsen and Sinai. So thank you all for joining for today's session. My name is Claudius. I'm an innovation manager at the European Supply Chain Vertical Office in Hamburg. Um, and I'm working very closely with one of the participants of today's fireside chat, uh, Rupesh Das, uh, who is the SVP Digital Innovation and Acceleration at Valenius Willemsen. And we also have a startup that is joining us for today's fireside chat. It's going to be Yanis, the CEO from Sinai. Um, so welcome both of you to the stage and feel free to turn on your cameras and join me. Hi, Claudius. Hi. 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 Uh, Hi yeah. both of you. Thanks a lot for joining. Maybe let's kick it off, Rupesh. Uh, can you briefly introduce yourself and share a bit of what Valenius is doing? Sure. You know, Valenius Williamson is, uh, I appreciate it's not a household name, you know, so we are a B2B business, so uh, makes sense. Uh, uh, so we are a, a shipping and logistics uh, company uh, in the segment of uh, transporting uh, automotive, that is uh, uh, cars. Uh, around the world, uh, from factory to any part uh, of the world in uh, dealer and similarly heavy equipments. Uh, those are our uh, sweet spot of uh, uh, the segments that we transport. We touch around uh, 7 million uh, cars on the land uh, doing these services and around 4.5 million of uh, car equivalent units on uh, the sea. Uh, we have our own uh, specialized Roro vessels. Uh, which we transfer on the sea, and then we have uh, a lot of uh, assets and uh, uh, carriers uh, around the world that we contract with uh, for this, right? So that's a little bit uh, of our business. Uh, we are listed, we are a public company listed in uh, uh, from Norway, but we operate uh, internationally uh, in most of the 
uh, continents and uh, countries around the world. And uh, that's a little bit about the company, uh, Claudius, and about me. Uh, I head uh, a unit called Digital Accelerator. I'm located in New Jersey, and uh, it's a very simple objective for me and the Digital Accelerator is how can we make a 10x impact uh, using uh, uh, technology and uh, business models uh, combining with uh, our core business of logistics and shipping services towards either internally consuming these services or uh, creating new commercial opportunities for us uh, using these uh, technologies. So that's that's what uh, I'm uh, uh, mandated uh, to do. Yeah. It's exciting. I mean, I've been working with you for two years now. It's, it's exciting to work with you. You have a global network and you cover a very wide range along the value chain. Uh, you don't only transport cars, but you also do additional services on land in the handling of cars, etc. So there are many exciting use cases that we have also already covered. But let me turn to our second guest, uh, Janis. Thanks a lot for joining. Feel free to introduce yourself as well. Hello. So thank you very much for welcoming us today. So I'm uh, Janis, the CEO of uh, Sinai. Uh, I have 12 years experience in maritime and technologies. Uh, we're working with uh, various uh, industries, uh, including the, the Navy. And at Sinai, we are uh, a digital hub. So it's a, it's a cloud-based platform where we have gathered uh, maritime data from all over the world. And then we process those data using uh, algorithm ranging from statistics to uh, artificial intelligence to produce uh, two type of indicators, which is logistic indicators to uh, improve operation at sea and at port, and also uh, environmental indicators to improve uh, sustainability. We are a team of uh, 50 uh, people, and uh, we have uh, more than 30 customers, and we really focus on uh, the maritime uh, market. And uh, we are very, uh, excited about uh, digitalizing uh, uh, corporates and industry in those uh, areas. Sounds like intuitively the two of you are already a match, uh, simply uh, looking from the technology and the application perspective um, where you operate. But Rupesh, help us a bit. So what was the exact use case that we were originally trying to solve? And can you put this into broader perspective um, at Valenius Willems? Yeah, absolutely. You know, in this context with Sinai, let me kind of give you a landscape that, you know, when, when a car which is uh, coming out of a factory in one part of the world uh, uh, and it goes to uh, the consumer where you kind of uh, drive it out of a dealership or, you know, drive it out of uh, any other location, uh, this, right? Uh, there are so many things that happen in between. You don't need a scratch on your car when it comes, you know, when you drive it out of the dealer, but just imagine it is coming from thousands of miles away. Uh, stuff right and there are around 15 to 20 different providers or touch points around this whole logistics and supply chain easy you know sometimes more sometimes less but around that so of course you know the information is fragmented uh, the handovers the 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 objectives of each of the player in the chain may be different so long story short is that you know uh, there is a lot of fragmentation and that results into some kind of unpredictability uh, for everybody in the uh, uh, chain uh, around, you know, when will this uh, uh, vessel arrive at this port? When will this, uh, you know, these kind of cars be uh, uh, be offloaded, you know, and so on and so forth. So what we took is one part of that supply chain is the port or the maritime part. And we said, how can we like make it, what if we can make it a little easier for our voyage operators, right, who deal with all the, these voyages and uh, you know, and and channel it, when to have sh which ship where, how should we, you know, either speed an up or slow down or whatever it is, right, to get to a terminal. You have the terminal operators, right, who who uh, allocate berths and times and their various carriers coming in over there and stuff like that. And then you have uh, customers, right, uh, who uh, uh, are uh, having some downstream activities to be planned based on that. So we said, how do we kind of combine all of this uh, fragmented data, uh, right, and uh, 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 and how we create a port intelligence solution where multiple stakeholders, our customers, our voyage operators, maybe the terminal operators, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, suppliers could uh, you know uh, leverage this, right, uh, 
uh, for A, efficiency, but uh, B, for sustainability, because there is a lot of wastage uh, due to uh, not having these uh, proper information, you know, in terms of fuel, in terms of trucks waiting uh, to, you know, uh, take cargo and there's a fuel wastage there. The ships may speed up and come to a port, but then, uh, then realize that you have to wait anyway uh, for a day over there to unload. So you, you could have slowed down the ship, you know, so there are lots of factors beyond operations is on the sustainability side, uh, Claudius, that kind of gave us an opportunity saying, let's try to address this port intelligence uh, vision. You know, and that's how we got started. I'll come to the use case a little later. I think. Sure, sure. Sounds like a problem that has many complexities and multiple variables going into an equation that would make ideal operations or that would lead to ideal operations. So, Yanis, how did Sinai came, come into play and, and why were you a good fit for solving that problem? Well, so at Sinai, we, we believe that uh, the data technologies uh, uh, is helping uh, maritime uh, corporates to uh, better improve uh, their operation at sea and their transparency. So for that, we have gathered uh, more than 200 terabytes of data from all over the world. So, so we have uh, uh, historical AIS data and real time data. We have uh, weather uh, information, but also much more, including biodiversity, uh, uh, water quality and so on. And then into our team, we have an AI expert and maritime expert, and we have developed um, uh, complex algorithms and machine algorithms to uh, be able to um, uh, predict um, uh, estimated time of arrival, predict ETA, uh, but also predict uh, port congestion and also predict the, the impact of uh, human activities on, on biodiversity. So. So then, um, uh, while in Spunemsen really have a vision on that the technology uh, uh, is very helpful to give this transparency to, to improve operation at sea. So for us, it was really a good fit and we, we, uh, we really appreciate to, uh, to, to share this common vision and to, to work on, on this uh, technology side. Cool. I mean, Rupert, I assume you spoke to a couple of startup service providers um, who could potentially solve that problem. So why did you ultimately choose them, the CNI, to tackle that problem? And how did you start? Um, what was the start or the beginning of the process? Yeah, that's an interesting, and you're right, right? It means uh, there, there are uh, various solutions uh, out there, you know, various uh, uh, companies trying to solve uh, this uh, this issue and you know and everything is seeing it from a different lens so so it makes sense you know because we do need various uh, people to be attacking the space uh, for the betterment right uh, overall uh, uh, with uh, Sinai it was interesting you know uh, Yanis and me had met in Hamburg actually uh, in uh, the summer uh, late summer of 2019 and uh, we kind of uh, uh, via plugin at one of the plug and play events and it was interesting that how uh, we could uh, very soon realize that, you know, we both see uh, the vision, but also I think we both are realists uh, that, uh, you know, you also need to act in the present uh, kind of. Uh, so, so, uh, so I think that was where it all started, where we could see that, okay, the, the lot, it's complex, it can be done, but can we start taking small nuggets or bites at the thing and, you know, and demonstrate certain things, right? And that's how our engagement uh, started. And, Little bit, you know, what Sinai, uh, well, what the uh, Yanis's team, like David, and then the others from his team have brought to the table, which Yanis uh, is humble enough not to mention, is that there's a lot of complexity, right? But they also, what we found is that uh, Sinai and David and the team try to make it simple user experience as far as the end user is consumed. You know, so all this complexity, how do you hide it behind? and make it a little easier for the consumer, right? To the voyage operators, the customers and all to kind of not get, not get you know, enamored by all the dashboards and stuff and all, and just make it simple uh, to see what does it mean for them and what action do they need to take, right? So I think that is what we have encountered as we have worked uh, with uh, uh, Sinai is that we, we do see the long vision, but we also see what needs to happen in the next 30 days, you know? And I think having a partner like that who can, you know, see the vision, 
but also act in the present uh, is quite invaluable. It's very, very interesting. It makes it makes a lot of sense. Thanks for, for laying that out. So, Yanis, what were some of the challenges that you encountered throughout the process, if there were any? Yeah, well, um, what I can say um, in general in the maritime uh, in the maritime industry uh, and in, in many industries, the the main problem is is the time uh, that the people want to dedicate it to digitalization. And what we really appreciate with uh, what in is is that the team uh, take the time uh, with us because one of the major challenge is the acculturation phase is to have a common vision, but also a, a common understanding of the pain point on the solution that could be uh, designed. And for that, we, we create a specific team uh, between a CNA team and Wallenius Williams team. And we spend time together uh, with a various workshop uh, 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 with a user-centric approach and ideation to identify the key pain point and which uh, technical solution could be done. And at each step, we really stay focused on user and, and market. And um, yes, there is a difference of sizes between between a, a startup and a large corporate and 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 uh, a different of processes but by creating this uh, uh, command team we join our force and uh, it was a strength and uh, by this way we managed to build a, a valuable solution and and very very quickly and very fast can you uh, Claudia, yeah, uh, Claudia, Claudia, you know my my dog wants to join the conversation so you will hear some uh, background noise with my dog and you know? also th that means it's very exciting conversation yeah. <laughs> i was just about just about to say he's probably as excited about the whole project that the two of you executed together um as, as we are so happy yeah. happy to have him with us no problem yeah. at all can you Rubesh, can you share some light on the outcomes what what did you get out of the project where was the benefit for Valenius? yeah so I, I, as i mentioned before right although there are various you know uh, areas that we can get we have uh, carved out a couple of uh, things uh, in the near term uh, which uh, uh, we are working together on uh, and uh, what we have also done uh, is that we have actually engaged one of our end customers in this uh, process uh, because we, do, we, we want to make sure uh, that uh, the outcome is uh, not only for Valenius Williamson, but also one of our customers. And uh, uh, so we have engaged a couple of uh, customers for, for reasons of, uh, for various reasons, I cannot name all of those customers here right now, but we have engaged that. So between Sinai, the customer, our customer and us, we are looking at uh, a couple of use cases. You know, one is around uh, port uh, congestion and uh, uh, one is uh, around uh, better insightful actionable uh, uh, data around uh, uh, around where the assets are you know uh, mm. and uh, and uh, whether they're headed and uh, uh, also combining that the beauty i think there are lots of solutions over there which can just plug in data and give what we are trying to do is combine the the objective and subjective information also so there is a lot of uh, uh, information or intelligence in people's mind uh, because of their experience they know many things there's memory muscle so we are peeling off a little bit and the solution will be a combination of a lot of objective data complemented uh, by people you know who know the business who know the things so that we can bring this together uh, as a solid offering uh, to our customers uh, which is like diff which that combination is a little unique you know uh, Claudius where you combine the human intelligence with the uh, with the solution, and yes, over the period of time, the AI and ML can you know peel off certain part of it, can start getting better. But I think to be realistic, right now we see that you know first steps is to get all this data for these two use cases, combine it with the human intelligence that we have, complement and bring that human intelligence as data into this. And that becomes the solution. So those are the things we we are on our way to do a soft launch in uh, November. Uh, we have had successful POCs, 
and we are uh, on our way to do a soft launch in November, December, sometime around that time, including with our customers. So we are excited about that. We look very much forward to that. Is it a must to involve the end customer? Well, nothing is a must, right? But I think in today's day and age, you need to become a little open. And this is in our industry and many, right? People keep many things close to their chest, right? Kind of. And I and, and I believe that, you know, 80 to 90 percent of the time you don't need to, you know, uh, kind of. So, so I think that it's very important. And also, right, it's a change of mindset and culture that, you know, it's okay to involve the customer when things are not fully cooked, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. they, they they get, yes, they get to see a little bit the mess in the kitchen and stuff like that. But you know what, uh, you know, it's better. Maybe they can give some advice over there and stuff and make it better. So, so yes, we take some risks by, you know, becoming a little vulnerable, right, uh, uh, towards that. But, uh, but, but it's, it's actually good because, you know, the customer also feels comfortable that we are being transparent with them. And uh, so I do see there is a lot of value. Of course, you have to determine when to bring in because time is essence. They also we, we appreciate their time, respect their time. So we don't want, so you have to strike that balance, right? But that, as a principle, I would say it is good to involve uh, the customers, just know when when to do it. Yanis, how long, how long have you been working on the POC now? And how long do you think the overall POC will, will last or take uh, in terms of like weeks, month? Well, for, 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 for the POC phase, uh, we uh, first start, uh, as I said, with the ideation workshops uh, to, uh, to really uh, be sure that uh, we have a, a, a command uh, uh, approach, we align on the approach and we align on, on, on what have to be done. And then during the POC phase, we use a agile methodology uh, with, uh, with regular and transparent process review to be able to adapt during the, during the project and be able to, uh, to, to change or uh, adapt the project. Uh, um, so POC for us is one of our favorite approach to, to start because it's only on a few months period. And uh, the advantage that you can quickly assess the technical feasibility uh, of the solution and you can have fast iteration uh, to improve the solution and be sure it fit uh, the customer needs and it fit the users and it fit the market so so it's it's few months with with a fast uh, fast iteration I have, I have two more questions Rubesh, especially for you I know that from a corporate perspective the process is rather fast and usually you're you're also innovating at a very rapid pace how do you usually work your way through it yeah, I mean, you know, Claudius, that's one of the challenges. I, I, my background is, you know, I was uh, uh, prior to taking this digital accelerator role or starting it in Villainous Williamson, I was uh, the head of uh, global IT uh, in the previous role, right? So uh, I'm pretty familiar with how systems and business processes come together and how much time it takes. So, so in a way, that was an advantage to come in. But this, in this space, right, you need to move very fast. You need to take risks. You know, you need to state gate things. There's no one answer to it, uh, uh, Claudius, but I would say there's a science and there's an art in doing this, right? So the science part is that we have formed a playbook of, you know, how do you take it in three-step process of incubate, socialize, operationalize, you know, how do you go towards ideation, proof of technology, proof of concept during incubation, you know, you do pilots and soft launch during socialization, and then you, you know, you, you launch and scale during operationalization. So there is a method to the madness, right? Kind of, it's not that sequential, but there is something like that, right? And then there are lots of things, right? I think so there's that part. It's one of the critical factors for us has also been to have a global ecosystem of partners, partners like Sinai, you know, many such partners who can from day zero come with, you know, something on the table, move up, you know, so we are not restricted to our processes, our environment, our things, right? Uh, Sinai can independently do that, and then we can at a certain point start integrating, you know, so, so we move very fast around that, right? And then, of course, there is an art part of it, right? You need to know where your organization is, which, who are the influencers, you know, which projects will give traction, you know, sometimes some of the initiatives may have a bigger benefit, but the timing may not be right. So you need to pick up things which will have traction, 
which will demonstrate success, you know, which success drives a lot of other, you know, people to join that, you know, then more people want this starts demand. So I think there's a lot of things, but I would say at the end, right, that um, what I've realized a little bit, my two cents is that, you know, uh, there are three things which matters in the art part, it's speed, execution, and happy people, you know. So those are the three things you need and the magic happens uh, then, you know, kind of. So, so that's all I can say. Well, I think that, that you're a great example of someone who has really like mastered this process, um, this innovation process, uh, running it quickly, but also uh, taking into consideration the other dimensions that you just mentioned, especially happy people um, being a long term partner of yours as well. Yanis, my last question. We look very much forward, obviously, to learn more about the full outcome um, of the of the joint project you had with Valenius. But at this point in time, are there advice? Is there any advice you can give to other startups? Any key takeaways or learnings? Yes, um, by um, by collaborating with startups such as Nice, so what are news for them? or all our cooperators looking for innovative idea on fast development and for that my, my advice is really to uh, uh, take time for the acc acculturation phase so to to really understand your partner values challenges organization to align on the vision and to align on the project and for that i think that the startup must be proactive is to to not do not hesitate to initiate suggestions and ideas think out of the box but then be agile to adopt your product and your concept uh, to the need of the customers and not stuck on your own id because it's very important to be user centric and market centric and take the time to make interview to really understand the ecosystem the value chain uh, the players and to be sure that your product will be useful at the end of the, of the day. And the last point is to be evolutive because uh, there is new needs coming uh, uh, step by step and you have to be prepared for the unexpected. I couldn't agree more. Um, Janis Rubisch, we wish you best of luck. Uh, we look forward to hearing more once the project is fully executed. Um, and until then, thanks a lot for joining and uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you Thank very you. much. Yeah. All right, I'd like to thank Claudius, Rupesh, Giannis, oh, and of course, uh, Rupesh's dog for sharing their amazing story with us today. Um, finally, last but not least, I'll be introducing Sean, who will be facilitating the fireside chat between Trimac and Cognac. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Sean Almirab. I am the Ventures Associate here for the Plug and Play Supply Chain Team. Uh, we have one more fireside chat left for you guys. So uh, right now, I'd love to welcome Derek Gillespie, the VP IT and Innovation at TriMac Transportation, and Vahan Jakarian, the Global Commercial Executive at Cogniac, to the stage with me. Perfect. Hey, guys, how's everything going? Great, John. How are you? Doing well, doing well. Thank you very much. Doing great. Good to see you both. Yeah, great to have both of you guys here. Uh, yeah, so I guess to start, it'd be great if we can have you guys do quick introductions on yourselves and maybe start with a little bit about what Triback and Cognac are uh, are doing and what you guys do specifically for them. Uh, Derek, if we want to start with you. Sure, thanks. Uh, so my name is Derek Gillespie. As I was introduced, uh, I'm the VP of IT and Innovation here at uh, Trimac Transportation. And uh, we're one of North America's leading uh, bulk truck and bulk commodity uh, haulers uh, in the trucking segment. Uh, we operate uh, many thousands of uh, vehicles, trucks and trailers uh, at a variety of locations across North America and uh, deliver all of the uh, uh, primarily raw materials, but other chemicals and uh, things like that that are uh, difficult and challenging to handle. Most definitely. Welcome, Derek. And then Vahan, over to you. First of all, thanks, John. So my name is Vahan Chikarian. I'm Chief Partnership Officer for Cognac. I've been with the company about three and a half years. So Cognac have an AI-based software platform that uh, delivers the ability to automate any visual inspection tasks. So we're a no-code, low-code platform. 
and the thrill that we're all together talking to, uh, you know, in, in regards to how Trimac and Cognac have formed a partnership mm -hmm. through what started out of plug and play. So excited to be here uh, after first introductions. Perfect. Awesome. Well, thank you guys both for those intros. I guess to start, you know, I want to talk about the relationship between Cognac and Trimac, where it started. I know it was a little bit different than most startup and corporate relationships that you guys didn't really start with a pilot and you went straight to a commercial engagement. So Vahan, if you can describe the sales cycle from Cognac's point of view and best practices for handling a relationship with a corporate partner over that span of time. Sure, sure. So, you know, our first introduction to the Trimac team was, I'd say about two and a half, three years ago, uh, where there was a deal flow actually, where the CEO of Trimac and several people were there. I think what resonated with what Cognac was doing with the Trimac team is that I'd say two or three of the folks there also came from the rail background and we'd had some successes already in rail. So uh, the feeling at Trimac was if these guys can tackle rail related activities, they can easily tackle some of the stuff we have. So really there wasn't a real clear use case at the beginning, but there was definitely a clear uh, opportunity to where Trimac was pushing the envelope for how to incorporate digital solutions in its environment. And so, you know, Derek and I and some others quickly established a relationship and stay in touch to figure out where we could engage and really use, you know, things in advanced uh, digital solutions to uh, deliver the solution we are delivering today to, to Trimac. Most definitely. And then in terms of that relation, Vahan, if you can dive a little bit deeper on it, how, I guess, what were the touch points? Because I know it kind of spanned over several years. Um, how often were you guys in contact and what was that kind of looking like? So, you know, I'll start us off. I think Derek and I stayed in touch every few months and we're trying to figure out the first use case that was presented to us without going into any detail was extremely challenging, mm -hmm. but uh, for any company, right? So, but we, the thought was, you know, let's stay connected because there'll be other opportunities. And, you know, every six months or so, Derek and I spoke and there was a time where Derek says, I think I've got it. I really want to incorporate this sort of solution. And again, what Cognac really delivers the ability to automate visual inspection with a very limited number of images that kind of automates the system, teaches a system for what we call AI, creating AI. So the ability to have the, our engine make predictions and do this over a large scale of images in a given, given day. So really the desire on both our parts to where well, we're offering a technology that's you know game changing and Tramac is looking at how they can utilize the best technologies that are easy to plug in that don't require a lot of resources to help manage because you know you want to reduce again at the end of the day the touch points to the to to any any to the the platform. Right, most definitely. And then Derek, over to you from Trimac side of things. By skipping over a pilot, would you say it was harder to get buy-in from key stakeholders? Yeah, I mean, I'll pick up on what Bahan said earlier. Um, the first use case that we started talking about uh, is a very challenging one. Uh, there's a number of, of, of technological and other barriers to, uh, to that use case. And um, we tried a few different ways to, uh, to solve that challenge and weren't able to get there. But um, what we did realize though, was that we were really looking for a, a computer vision platform as Vahan said, that had broader applicability than just that one use case. So uh, we're very interested in a very challenging uh, technological and engineering problem. Um, but we didn't want to lose sight of the opportunity to work together on something that was very, uh, very interesting. So um, as Vahan said, we kept in touch every couple of months and uh, bounced around ideas. Some were more ambitious than others. Some were more practical than others. Um, and uh, when the time came that we had the, the exact right application, uh, we skipped the pilot and went straight to production. So uh, we had a, a live production need, a project that was funded, a project team assembled. Um, you know, all signs sort of pointed to yes, and uh, and we decided to uh, uh, to get going with it. Um, so from a stakeholder standpoint, what was really interesting was uh, when we pitched our proposed solution um, for uh, for the solution that we're doing, and the solution we're doing right now is uh, is a, effectively it's a document management uh, uh, solution, um, and just in terms of scale, you know, we're probably processing thousands, five or six thousand you know images a day. Um, and so quite a, quite a challenge from a, a technical standpoint and a, and a volume standpoint. But mm -hmm. um, once we presented those business users and, and stakeholders with a solution that was viable, they were super excited about it. Mm -hmm. um, now, um, we were in a position where we could go straight to production with that one, and, uh, and we did. Uh, and now what's starting to happen is that instead of sort of pushing a solution in the more challenging areas, we're actually getting a little bit of a pull from our business units 
um, looking for more and wanting us to apply the same thinking uh, to their problems. Mm -hmm. Most definitely. And then you kind of touched on it a little bit, but I want to follow up on how you guys were so sure that Cognitive Solution was, was kind of the best fit for Trimac. I know that relationship was there um, and you guys were kind of bouncing off ideas, but was there anything else? I mean, um, you know, as Vahan said, I mean, my background uh, prior to coming back to trucking was in was in rail and, and some of the expertise that uh, Cognac has in the rail space um, uh, was very impressive. And uh, we knew that the solution that we had for our, our first production install uh, was probably simpler than that. Um, it was challenging and then it was unique. No one had ever done it before, um, but we knew that it was probably simpler than what had already been done. So. Um, from our standpoint, we had a very high degree of confidence uh, that uh, the solution would work, and uh, some some very uh, you know as you would expect a large company to do um, some some basic due diligence and some reference calls confirmed uh, what we knew, and uh, then it was time to get going. Right on, right on. That's awesome. Um, and then over to Bahan. I know Cognac's vision system. You know, obviously, you guys have so many different applications that you guys can play into. Um, and then Derek just kind of touched into it on the specific solution that you guys are using for TriMac. Yeah. Um, I guess in, in your own words, can you dive deeper on, on what exactly you guys are doing? So this one was really, again, document reading, right? The ability to manage documents and without going into a lot of detail about what, what parts, but it's really classification detection. These are some of the, you know, we have about a dozen applications available to where one of our customers on their own can build a pipeline and this was done pretty quickly. But, you know, the areas that we generally serve, and I, I'm, I'm diverting a little bit from what you said, but it's really the, a lot in industrial inspection, manufacturing inspection. So this really goes into this industrial inspection space of, you know, how do you manage, you know, documents come in your facility and accurately label them so that, uh, you know, you have proper traceability and so forth. Most definitely. Um, and then you guys have been, what is it now, like six months working together or so on this on this specific project. Are there any, uh, you know, results, any, you know, case studies that you guys are able to share with us? I'll, I'll leave that open to both of you guys right now. Yeah, maybe I'll jump in on that one there, Sean. I think, um, you know, jumping back to what you said earlier on and what Vahan said about other applications, I mean, we're very interested in safety and security, um, given the, the market that we're in and, and um, the nature of our business. Uh, but of course, we're in, we're in business. We're also concerned with uh, with efficiency. And um, you know, what we saw with Cognac here really was an opportunity to um, um, have a platform that could potentially solve problems in all of those various dimensions. Um, as I said at the beginning, we we operate several thousand vehicles, so we're we're interested in the performance of those vehicles uh, and their components. Uh, and and uh, we're excited about uh, what the future might hold for our our relationship here. Um, now, jumping to the sort of question you just asked, so some of the challenges we encountered, I'll, I'll maybe take that one first here. Um, you know, I would say speed uh, was a challenge. This relationship started two and a half to three years ago. Uh, so the sales cycle was uh, painfully long, I'm sure, from Vaughn's standpoint. Um, and, uh, you know, I alluded to it uh, previously. We just didn't have the dedicated product team nor uh, project team or the vision to uh, to deliver what those first, uh, first few concepts were. Um, once we pivoted to that alternate solution where we had strong business sponsorship and a clear and compelling need, uh, things moved really, really quickly. And I'm thankful to Cognac for their patience with us in, uh, in those early days. And, you know, Sean, to add to what Derek said, Derek, thank you for that. So, you know, our technology is, I would, I would classify in a couple of different ways, right? It's, it's trans transformational, it's disruptive, right? So it takes, you know, companies that are visionary in wanting to employ the latest in digital technology to do this, right? Once you're on board, it's very easy to add more use cases. So Derek and I are now in constant regular discussions about what other things can be used on the platform, because once you've got one use case started, you can manage multiple workflows under the same, uh, you know, cloud or on-prem umbrella, in this case, you know, cloud-based, and most of our deployments are cloud-based, but adding more use cases now becomes a lot more trivial, right? So we've got that ship sailing, and, the, and the, you know, the question is, you know, how do you integrate more use cases that continue to add value to the two Trimax environment? Mm -hmm. Most definitely. And then, Bahan, from your own point of view, uh, I guess, what were some of the challenges other than the, the long sales cycle that, that you kind of encountered on, on your side? 
you know, again, it goes back to, I think we've covered a little bit, right? So how do you adopt this sort of disruptive transformational technology? And, you know, the first time you talk about it, it's okay, that sounds great. Uh, then the second time is, okay, now I really get it. And the third time is, how do we now employ this in our environment, right? So it's constant education. I see a big part of our role is constant education of our potential users or even current users for what they can do with the, with the, with the platform. And I'd, I'd add too, I mean, one of the other challenges we had, a TriMac issue on our side, I'm going to call it the scale problem. Um, you know, our initial plan was to rewire the Cognac solution into an existing solution that we had. Um, and uh, it on paper it looked like a good idea. Uh, in practice, when we turned it on, um, we we found we broke and found every flaw that existed in all of the other solutions that surrounded uh, what we plug Cognac into. So um, it was uh, it was a bit of a challenge to manage expectations internally because there's a lot of questions around um, what's broken and what's not working. But the issue was really on our side. We you know we weren't to be quite frank we weren't quite prepared for the uh, for the velocity and the scale of output that we were going to be getting. Um, and it caused a whole, a whole bunch of uh, old technology surrounding it to break. Um, so good, good news, you know, bad news, good news. Bad news is it broke. Good news is it gave us the opportunity to fix something that probably should have been fixed uh, before. And, uh, and now it's working really well. Um, you know, the other comment I'd make too here, you know, one of the challenges for anyone else thinking about a, a disruptive and transformational project is, Expectations management is always a tough one. Um, you know, technology like this, the learning curve is steep, but but thankfully very short. Um, the, you know, the the challenge with our business friends soon became, you know, hey, we're getting turnaround times of of um, anywhere between a couple minutes to at the busiest times of the day, maybe you know as high as an hour or two. Mm -hmm. And so my business users are starting to complain and saying, well, how come it's taking me an hour to get the result or two hours to get the result? And I have to keep reminding them that. Before we implemented the solution, you were looking at 36 to 48 hours, um, and uh, and there's a lot that goes into it. So expectations management is certainly part of it, and being willing to roll with the uh, um, roll with the challenges and and fix those issues that come up um, would be the key. Yeah, most definitely. And that was kind of a perfect segue into my next question, and uh, kind of surrounding it, I guess, advice for other startups and key takeaways and learnings. Uh, Bahan, we'll start with you and then get that startup's perspective and then we'll kick sure. that over to Derek and get the corporate perspective. So, you know, I'll give you my experience, right? So Cognac has been part of the plug and play environment for, you know, about two and a half years or so. And, you know, we've been in five different programs. I'd say, you know, the advice to other startups would be one is engage and be involved. Plug and play does a great job of creating the environment for you to you know, offer a solution, but really it's up to the startup to really follow through, right? Not expect anything more to happen there, right? So, you know, we were diligent in making sure that we continue this relationship and, you know, keep the communications open uh, and take advantage of every opportunity that plug and play offer for introductions, for, you know, events like this, for giving talks uh, about, uh, uh, you know, a given solutions. So be, be persistent with, you know, the, the solution that you have with the companies that you get introduced to and make yourselves available, right? So the fortune that we have is that, you know, we're in San Jose and plug and plays in Sunnyvale, at least one of the, you know, 20 some offices, but most of the meetings were in San, in Sunnyvale and to be available even within a couple hours notice saying there's an opportunity to get in front of a company. So may, I would say to any startup, make yourselves available today, obviously in the Zoom world, but you know, your openness and availability gets you uh, the exposure to, to pitch a solution. Yeah, no, most definitely. We would definitely do appreciate you joining all of our last minute deal flows, Rohan. And then over to you, Derek. Yeah, thanks. I, you know, I'd echo uh, Bahan's comments here uh, a little bit, and, and I'd add, um, keep your eye on the prize. Don't don't shy away from the big, hairy, audacious goals that you've got, but also don't be afraid to pivot. Um, you know, in this case, you know, Vahan and I still have our eye on on a, on a bigger goal here. Um, but I I recall, as I know Vahan does, the day I phoned him and said, "Hey, I've I've got a perfect application that you've never thought of, um, but trust me." It's it's something we're going to have to do to 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 get a win here and uh, and prove that we can do this and make it work and uh, that's how we landed with the production implementation that we've got today. Um, so it was a bit of a pivot, you know, out of left field, I think a little bit, um, but it worked and uh, and we're building on it. 
Yeah, most definitely. No, that's great. Awesome. And then I think we have time for one more question. So I guess I want to, you know, see if you guys have any plugs, see what's up in the future for both of you guys. Vahan, we can start with you. So, you know, uh, as we grow, obviously, you know, a year ago or so, we're 16, 17 people. We're pushing 50 to get to today, right, and, and continue to grow. You know, the things that we're obviously trying to do is expand into what adjacent markets we could serve, right? Manufacturing inspection, industrial inspection is kind of, you know, 80, 90 percent of our business. But what other, you know, parallel technologies might there be that we might jump into new use cases and so forth, right? So stay focused, do a good job with the things that we've done well so far, but also how do we expand our our, uh, our reach without jeopardizing any of, uh, of our relationships or the, the focus in, in technologies that we serve. Awesome, and then Derek, over to you. Is there anything you guys are, are able to share with us? Yeah, so uh, re really broadly, safety and security um, are probably the top, the top things from, uh, from my standpoint. So, um, very interested in uh, in all the things that cameras and processing of images captured by cameras can provide uh, as it relates to that. So think about the performance of vehicles, think about access control of facilities, think about um, components uh, and, and those kinds of things. Uh, those are all the interesting problems that are uh, um, that are on our to-do list next. Perfect. Awesome. Hey, hey, Sean, if, if I could add, right, I think it's important for the startup to listen to a customer's pain point, right? What are they trying to automate? What are they, what are they, what are they trying to really do? And that's, I think, what creates a winning partnership where, uh, you know, both, uh, you know, the end user and the, the partner or the, the, the startup within the plug and play environment would, would show some success. Yeah, most definitely. You definitely want to address a, a problem rather than create a problem yourself. So um, great. Awesome. Well, I believe that's all the time we have left, but I uh, really do appreciate both of your guys' time today. And uh, we will catch you guys next time. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks so much. Thanks, Derek. Thanks. Have a good day. Thanks. Bye, Sean. I'd like to thank Sean, Derek, and Vahan for the final success story of the day. We'll be now moving on to the award section of the of the of the morning. And to start off with, I would like to. Um, Hand out the first award to the Global Logistics and Supply Solutions Company, Willanius Wilhelmsen, and give a special shout out to Rupesh and his team who have gone above and beyond working with a number of our startups as they have overhauled their entire product offering and really reimagined the services they provide to their customers. Um, this year, they have like truly worked and helped facilitate throughout all of COVID, really mentoring a lot of our different startups. And for that, we're giving them a Corporate Innovation Award. <laughs> Up next, we'd like to recognize Growmark, one of our new partners of the year. You know, as one of the newest partners in the supply chain vertical, they've really gone above and beyond, like truly doing unprecedented work in regards to deal flows, reverse deal flows, POC, pilots, and investments. They really have set a new benchmark for partners, and for that, we really want to thank their team, as well as Brad, our champion there, for all the work they've done this year. And last but not least, I'd like to recognize Yamato, who during COVID really put in the extra mile of work working with all of our different startups. They absolutely are the, the forefront of innovation in the supply chain vertical. And actually, they are with us here today. So I'd like to invite the Yamato team on stage to receive their award. Thank you, Kay. Uh, thank you. I want to say thank you to um, our plug and play team um, because Yamato was uh, very, uh, our activity was very active even under the COVID-19 situation. Um, yeah, so thank you so much, plug and play team. All right. I'll give you two. Up next, we will be uh, honoring our startups from both our batch nine Silicon Valley, and as well as our first batch from our Toronto startup program. 
So from Silicon Valley, we would like to uh, award Aera AI, Avatar, and Source Map. And with us today, I'd like to bring on stage Fuel Me. Uh, thank you so much, Plug and Play, for having us. It's been a great program. They're an incredible resource for connecting startups to, you know, cus companies that can use new technologies. And I think that's very valuable today, where there's a sometimes a disconnect between, you know, up-and-coming technologies and companies that could benefit from them. So it's been an incredible experience. We've met a lot of partners, and uh, they've been uh, very important for our growth. So thank you so much. Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right. My assistant's not here. <laughs> All right. And then, and then up next from Toronto, I'd like to honor Peer Ledger, Morpheus Network, and Zero Key, and Eagle, who is with us today. So I'd like to invite them up on stage. Thank you. Absolutely. No, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks, everyone. Thanks to Plug and Play. Uh, I'm here from, from Canada. We had a great success over the last two years in logistics and supply chain, working with top tier companies, um, and looking forward to working with Plug and Play in, in our upcoming investment round. Thank you, everybody. All right. Thank you. And that concludes our uh, award section, and now we're on to new partners. And for new partners, it is my pleasure to introduce Dot Foods, the largest food distribution company in the United States with over 100,000 pro in product offerings across over 800 different manufacturers. They are in less than truckload sizes, one of the, once again, one of the largest companies in the United States. We'll be showing a short video. When our parents, Robert and Dorothy Tracy, started this business in 1960, they didn't really think of themselves as pioneers. Uh, they were from the Midwest, pretty humble. They created an environment, a culture, that continues to be our, our most competitive advantage uh, that we have today. And they really didn't have any idea this business would get this large, and here we are today with three generations of Tracy family members involved. Dad worked in the dairy industry back in the 40s and 50s. And he saw firsthand a lot of problems that these uh, dairy manufacturers had. And came up with a great idea. It was all about small order consolidation. He felt like this consolidation program could be a really good solution. This idea was too good to keep from the rest of the food industry. Food manufacturers are really good at making product. And they're good at shipping it out in large increments. One area they struggle with is small shipments, and that represents a large percent of their customer base. Consumers want choice, and it doesn't matter how large you are in terms of wholesaler, you receive thousands of items every day in terms of less than truckload shipments, which is pretty inefficient. The costs are high, both from the manufacturer's perspective and the distributor wholesalers who's receiving them. Enter redistribution. Redistribution, we convert a lot of those small orders, those less than truckload shipments, into full truckloads that we pick up at the manufacturer that ultimately gets consolidated with other products that is then shipped to the last mile distributor or wholesaler that delivers to a restaurant or to some retail outlet. By doing that, we take a lot of the cost out of that supply chain, we take out a lot of the complexity, and we improve the service from top to bottom. The concept of redistribution hasn't really changed from when we started the business in 1960 in a small town in the middle of the country called Mount Sterling, Illinois. We have a lot of customers that order a wide variety of items from us and receive those weekly. One PO, one invoice that they receive, and one check that they cut. 
The difference really is the fact that we were selling a really narrow scope to a small set of customers back then, but today we sell to a wide variety of customers, not only in the U.S., but North America and really all over the world. In order to really do that, we have to continue to invest in our people, continue to invest in our processes, and really build our capabilities to tap those opportunities. One example is something that we call the Dot Expressway. It's one of the most used sites really in the food service industry and the reason why is it's the go-to. It's the go-to for information and that really leads access to the wide variety of products that we have. Our mission is to significantly contribute to the success of our business partners. It's who we are as a company and it is what we stand for. Our brand promise is just that. It's really a promise to all those people that are doing business with us. Trusted values is what they can expect when they deal with our people. Our people are focused on delivering innovative solutions that's really going to drive shared growth for all the stakeholders involved. I'd now like to introduce uh, the CEO of Dot Foods, Joe Tracy, to say a few words. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Joe Tracy. I'm the CEO of Dot Food. I'm sorry I can't be with you in person today. You know, our, our vision is really all about improving lives by enhancing choice for everyone everywhere. And as you heard in the video, uh, a large part of our brand promise is delivering innovative solutions to drive shared growth for all of our stakeholders. And as we all know, the pace of change continues to accelerate, and we must continue to search and invest in solutions to ensure we not only maintain, uh, but grow our market share. We have a long history of investing in digital transformation. It started with our online dot expressway in the mid 90s, and our latest investments are two small technology startup companies called Shop Hero and Morrison both of which will help accelerate our digital journey. We currently have some of the best product data in the food industry, but we must take it to the next level. We are seeking solutions that allow us to continue to enhance choice for everyone everywhere. Since our beginning, our business has been built by solving problems in new and innovative ways. Partnering with companies who share that mission is more critical today than ever before. Thank you so much. We're excited about our new partnership. Thank you, Joe, and the entire Dot Foods team. I think I can speak for the entire supply chain team as well as myself to say that we're very excited to go on this journey with you. And now to close us out for the day, I'd like to invite Farzeen Shadapur to give us his closing remarks. Thank you, Leyland. Uh, they hadn't told me that uh, speakers get to take their masks off or I would have gotten a teeth cleaning, so apologies for that. Uh, I want to first thank my uh, team. Uh, they did a great job. It was a larger challenge to pull off a hybrid expo as opposed to just one that is in-person or virtual, and the whole uh, plug-and-play team really came together to help us do this. So again, uh, thanks to all of you for working so hard in the past few months to make this a reality. Uh, I want to recognize our corporate members who did a great job of meeting with the startups during the cohort uh, while it was virtual and again making time for them, sometimes across time zones since they happen to be in a different country and a different part of the world as opposed to the startup. And at the end, we made it work for everybody to work with everybody to meet to benefit from the office hours and the mentorships. So again, thank you very much for being flexible. I know some of you had office hours after having dinner with your children at home. So thank you for doing that. Uh, and yes, exactly. And a round of applause for everybody who has been working around the class. Uh, I would like to recognize the cohort uh, number nine that we had here in Silicon Valley. Uh, there are 20 of them, I won't name them one by one, but it was really a pleasure to work with them and to really get them initiated into 
our plug and play family. Uh, our plug and play family is now larger than before. We do not consider this a graduation. We consider this a beginning. So now they are inducted into the plug and play family and we will be working with them in the next few years until they become a unicorn or a decacorn. And uh, we are uh, sure hoping and uh, cheering all of them on. And I would also like to recognize the first cohort that we had in Toronto this past few months. It was an exciting experience, especially doing all of it virtually. Uh, many of them I have never met in person, and I'm hoping that I will get to meet with them uh, hopefully before the end of the year. So thank you very much for working with us, for being open to doing everything online. And uh, I know for a fact that many of you have benefited from this, and I'm sure that uh, in the next few months, all of you, as you continue to be a part of our family, will continue to benefit from this. Uh, with that, uh, again, thank you for joining us online and in person, and we look forward to the next uh, challenges and the next cohorts.